Hi again, and welcome to tonight's event featuring, as always, Jared Spool. Welcome, everybody. I'm, I'm very excited uh, to be here, very excited that you're all here, that you're, you're sharing this evening uh, with us. At, uh, uh, I know there are at least a few people here from Europe where it's, it's very late in the evening. Um, uh, but it's very exciting to, to be talking to y'all about this. And uh, today, uh, what I wanted to talk about is uh, how we use our outcomes as a spark for user experience. And uh, a lot of my work these days is in the area of uh, strategy. And so I thought I would talk about sort of this idea of, of how do we make the work that we do strategic? How do we make the work um, be something more than just a service for cleaning up the, the, the screen, cleaning up the, the, the way a product works and sort of working as a a back end process, but how do we actually get up front and get more proactive? So that's what I thought I'd talk about. Uh, before I start, uh, I want to tell you all about um, uh, how we're going to do this. So I've got, uh, I, I'm going to talk for about 20 or so minutes, and then uh, we'll turn to your questions. And because I've talked about this topic many, many times, um, uh, I am more interested in what you're interested in than what I would, uh, uh, what I'm interested in. So, um, what I would like to do is basically use your questions to to guide where we go. This is sort of a, a choose your own adventure. So let's talk about this idea of uh, using outcomes as a spark for UX. And I think where I want to start with this is, is uh, a lot of user experience work is tactical. It uh, Tactical work is things like running um, uh, a usability test or uh, uh, creating wireframes or, or making Figma files. And uh, uh, all of these um, tactical things uh, uh, are important. They have to be done. They are a, a critical part to good user experience work. But what they do is they end up making us uh, at the end of the process. Right, we tend to be uh, shoved into the the back end of the development and de and design process, and a lot of UX work is feels like a service. In fact, it sort of feels a lot like dry cleaning. Right, you know, when you take uh, clothes to the dry cleaner, you you bring this pile of clothes and you turn it over and you might point at a couple of stains that you'd like to have removed. And then uh, you go away and the dry cleaners do whatever dry cleaners do to their, um, uh, to their stuff. And then you come back later and they hand you clean clothes if the dry cleaner does a good job and uh, you thank them and that's that. And a lot of UX work has that sort of dry cleaner feel to it. You know, go make me some screens and we go away and we do whatever screen designers do. And then we come back and we hand you, you know, the finished screens or go run some usability tests and we go away and we run some usability tests and we come back and we hand you the results. You say, thank you. And the problem of this is that it's very reactive and it's very much gets into this sort of factory mode. And a lot of UX work feels a lot like a factory. It feels uh, very much like what we're spending our time doing is just getting more work from more folks, trying to do it as quickly as possible, turning it back, and then we get more work and we just keep doing this. And 
frankly, it's not particularly rewarding work for a lot of people. And it, it, there are so many things that are um, uh, uh, pushed back on. For instance, one of the things we hear a lot is, is people wanting to do real research and being told, yeah, we don't have time for that. That's, that's not what, what we want to do. And it, and it makes sense, right? If people think of you like a dry cleaner and the dry cleaner says, wait a second, I'd like to help you pick out what you're going to wear to the wedding because this outfit, you shouldn't be wearing this to the wedding, right? You're going to look funny at the dry cleaner when they do that. It doesn't make sense. But if we want to truly be more strategic, then uh, we need to change up how we're, we're, we're doing things. So let's talk about strategy for a second. So we can think of, we can think of tactics and we can think of strategy. This might be that time when you, you want to uh, switch your, your Zoom view to be speaker because uh, it'll make it easier to read what I'm writing. Uh, uh, it won't make it completely easy because my handwriting, the font I've chosen for today is sans legible, but uh, um, we'll do the best we can. The thing about tactics is that uh, they are uh, situation agnostic, right? The, 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 the types of things that we talk about as tactical in user experience work is, is creating wireframes, uh, uh, running usability tests, uh, producing Figma files. And we do this no matter what the project is, we do this whatever the um, uh, the uh, uh, the the exercise is it, it doesn't matter we, we, the situation doesn't play into it this is just what we do right and people often refer to this as process right what is your process it's it's funny that we we often ask people what their process is we ask candidates when we are uh, interviewing candidates for uh, 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 for a position, we will ask them, what is your process? As if it matters. As if, if we hired them, we'd ever let them do their process, right? Unless their process is our process, we don't really care what their process is. And frankly, there's a high chance that we'll never let them do our process because we never get to do our process. So this idea of process, this is a very sort of tactical thing. And I, it's part of the problem, right? Part of the reason that we're stuck in this world of sort of uh, dry cleaner service approach is that, that we fixate on process, right? Dry cleaners have a process for cleaning the clothes. That's what they fixate on. And if you don't like the process for one dry cleaner, you go and you find another dry cleaner. But the, the, the fact is, is that, is that that's not what we're here to deal with. A strategy is, we can define a strategy as a high level plan to uh, uh, attain a goal. And the high level plan to attain the goal is, is what we're talking about here. Dry cleaners don't have a high level plan to attain a goal because they, they just have a process for cleaning clothes. If they don't have something that says, well, I want you to look fantastic at the wedding. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go through your wardrobe and figure out what your best outfit is. And then we'll figure out if it needs cleaning or not. And that is, is a strategy that's not tactics. And so the thing about strategy is that it needs to be situationally aware. 
you know, if you're going to wear an outfit to the wedding, one of the rules of weddings is you can't look better than the bride. So you sort of need to know what the bride's going to look like in order to make sure that, that your outfit uh, uh, does not uh, uh, outshine the bride at the wedding. So that's uh, that's got to be part of what's going on. We have to be aware of what the situation is. We have to know whether it's going to be warm or cold. We have to know if we're going to travel there by airplane because our outfit has to fit on an airplane. So, you know, we, we there's all sorts of details that we have to take into account if we're thinking about strategy. And if something changes, then we have to adapt to that. And that's the thing about uh, uh, strategy. And the thing about strategy, particularly when we're talking about UX work, is the strategy is really about how do we use all of our knowledge, all of our um, uh, uh, experience, all of our tools, all of our skills, everything we know about user experience, how do we use that to make sure that the, that we are helping the organization achieve its overall goals. That's what a UX strategy is about. And part of our UX strategy means that we have to have some sort of UX goal. And so this is where outcomes come in. Outcomes are a way to think about the goal. Now, to understand what an outcome is, we have to contrast it with an output. An output are the things we deliver. So again, in UX, we deliver wireframes. We deliver test results and recommendations. We deliver Figma files, recommendations. I can do this. There we go. Figma files. So, you know, there's all sorts of things we deliver. All of these are tactical things. And the outputs that we deliver are important, right? So we can think of outputs as things we deliver. But an outcome, an outcome is a change in the world. It's a change in the world because we delivered something or maybe because we didn't deliver something. And so this is uh, uh, what we focus on with an outcome. Now, there are business outcomes, and if you read a lot of the press, there's, there's been a lot of discussion uh, about outputs versus outcomes. Uh, Josh Seiden wrote a fantastic book called Outcomes Over Outputs. Uh, Teresa Torres has written uh, this uh, book about continuous discovery habits, where she talks about uh, uh, coming up with opportunities to achieve outcomes. Uh, so there's, there's, there is uh, very much um, uh, this, uh, a lot of conversation about outcomes today, but almost always when everybody talks about outcomes, they talk about business outcomes. They talk about uh, uh, outcomes like increasing sales or um, uh, uh, reducing churn. Uh, or, you know, moving into new markets. And, and all of these things are important. And they're all, they, they are in fact all business outcomes. But it's, it's hard to, to, to tie business outcomes to UX work. In particular, there are a lot of business outcomes that if you focus on them, actually produce worse experiences for the user. For example, uh, let's take reducing churn, increasing retention, right? So, so we, want, we want subscribers to stay and we don't want them to unsubscribe. So, so we're reducing the churn of our subscription. Well, 
we've all been in uh been a, a subscriber or uh a, a, a customer of a service that doesn't want us to stop paying so they jump through hoops to make sure that the uh that that we don't subscribe right so they make it hard to unsubscribe they make it so that you have to call in to uh a call center and then the person in the call center will do their best to convince you not to unsubscribe they'll offer you a different package at a lower price hoping that you'll stay and and give you a deal and all these things and none of this is a good experience right this is not a, an improvement in uh, the subscribers world, but it is going to achieve the business result of increased subscription, right? The, the easiest way to uh, stop, uh, to increase retention is to take away the cancel button and just make it impossible to cancel. But that's not a good user experience. And so the problem with focusing on, uh, on these is that it leads us down a path of, of getting into patterns that are deceptive or just uh, wholly uh, uh, unfortunate that are not going to live a, uh, uh, not going to help somebody. So we need to rethink this. And the thing about outcomes is that a change in the world can either go two ways. It can either be a positive change or it can be a negative change. And again, this is unique to outcomes. Outputs have no quality implied at all, right? I can, I can create wireframes, but it doesn't mean it's a wireframe of a good design. Just delivering the wireframe is good enough, right? Because the, the goal of an output is to deliver something. I can run usability tests and I can deliver recommendations, but it doesn't mean they're good recommendations. That's not implied in the output. And in fact, doing, uh, uh, doing quality work takes more time, takes more effort. And as a result, uh, if people are trying to reduce time, and reduce effort, there's a good chance that they're going to optimize to poorer results and they can get away with that because they're measured on delivery. They're not measured on the quality of the results. So what we wanna do instead is we want to imply quality. So either we're making things, the change is making things better in the world or it's making things worse in the world. And so outcomes have this natural built-in quality, but worse for what? worse for whom? So that's the question, which brings me to the idea of UX outcomes. UX outcomes answer a question, right? A UX outcome answers the question, if we do a great job on whatever our output is, Right? If we do a great job on these wireframes, if we do a great job on this new feature, if we do a great job delivering this product, how will we improve someone's life? That's a UX outcome. A UX outcome is the answer to the question, if we do a great job on this product, feature, service, whatever it is we're building, how will we improve someone's life? It focuses on a person and it focuses on the improvement to that person's life. So if we do a great job on uh, retention, subscription retention, how will we improve someone's life? So let me tell you a story about that. So the folks at Netflix were seeing uh, that there were large numbers of people who would subscribe for a month, maybe two, and then they would cancel their subscription. 
Now they could have, and in some cases they tried to experiment with different ways to entice people to stay for a third month and then a fourth month, maybe offering them a discount or, or something else, but those things for the most part didn't work. So they went and they did some research and they started to talk to these people who were only joining for a month and then canceling. And what they found was that there was a bunch of these people who were on very uh, constrained budgets. These were people who just did not have a lot of disposable income. And when they would have a little bit of extra money, they would subscribe to Netflix. And they would binge watch as many shows in that month that they could watch. And before the 30 days was up, they'd cancel their subscription. And then they would consider redoing that months later. But here's the thing. When Netflix made the subscription process, the, the cancellation process more difficult, when they put up these roadblocks to, to, and friction to get people to not subscribe, unsubscribe, what they found was those people still unsubscribed, but what they didn't do was come back later because they remembered how painful the unsubscribe process was. And that they would then be required to sort of create a new account and have all these new things. So they changed it up. They changed it up to make unsubscribing as simple as possible. It's for, for these folks, it's basically one click. And it's really not an unsubscribe. It's just, let's put your account on pause. We're not gonna charge you anymore. And when you're ready with just logging into your account and you start watching, then we'll charge you again. And this way it became almost friction free to stop watching, not pay for as many months. And then when you wanted to treat yourself, log in again and binge watch the next season of uh, Stranger Things. And the revenue that they made from those people who infrequently would come back and binge watch grew substantially. It became a whole new revenue stream for them. And then that put the onus on, instead of coming up with a package and pricing to get people to stay on, it focused on figuring out what these people would want to treat themselves to. And what they'd want to treat themselves to would be better content. So they started investing in content that would appeal to these people who were the type of people who would just come in for a month and watch everything and then go away. And the more content they put in, the more they would frequently they would treat themselves to that content. And so by putting a human-centered lens on this business outcome by saying, how do we improve someone's life? We improve someone's life by giving them more reasons to come back and treat themselves to a month of binge watching. That's how a UX outcome works, right? A UX outcome is uh, a way for us to talk about the strategic goals of the organization in human terms. We can take any business priority. We can take anything that the business is trying to do and say, if we do a great job on that business priority, how will we improve someone's life? If we do a great job breaking into the Latin America market, how will we improve someone's life? If we do a great job uh, rolling out this whole new line of business, how will we improve someone's life? If we do a great job on merging our company with this company we're acquiring, how will we improve someone's life? Suddenly, we're talking about the UX of every major business decision. And that's the key part, right? 
every decision that an organization makes is a UX decision because every decision that the organization makes affects the user's experience. Certainly, it affects the user's experience if someone um, uh, uh, doesn't get the feature they want or the feature they want doesn't do what they need it to do. So those are definitively UX issues. But it also affects the user experience if uh, uh, the team that's building this doesn't have the skills they need or hasn't done the proper research. So project planning and uh, deciding on the roadmap and deciding what goes into a feature, uh, those are UX decisions. And deciding who is gonna be on the team becomes a UX decision because we put the wrong people on the team, we don't build a product that improves people's lives. Deciding on the budget, deciding on how soon we release the release dates, that makes a difference. Deciding on whether or not the, uh, the acquisition is actually going to provide a better experience than if we didn't acquire the company is a user experience decision. There are no decisions that are made that don't affect the user experience. If you don't believe me, go talk to the people at Southwest, Southwest Airlines, who uh, 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 just what, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, had to cancel 17,000 flights because of a user experience problem in their staffing system. The staffing system could not find crews and match them up with available planes. And they ended up canceling 17,000 flights, which affected about 2.4 million passengers. That was a user experience problem. So user experience is not just this thing that happens at the end. It's not just making it pretty. It's not just cleaning up the screens. It's not dry cleaning or janitorial work. User experience is every decision in the organization. Every product that or service that goes out has a user experience. It just either has a good experience or a poor experience. And that poor experience is gonna cost the organization a good experience is going to pay, pay off. And so if we want to have a UX strategy that focuses on delivering great user experiences, we have to come back and talk about the UX outcome. Now I'm going to, I'm going to stop in a couple of minutes for questions. So if you have questions, just put them in the chat question for Jared, but here's the deal. All right. The UX outcome, we can think of it in terms of a user's experience. So the user's experience is this series of things that, that our, our users, our customers, even our employees have to do. So uh, these, uh, we can think of this as a timeline, these little dots that I'm making here, each vertical, line of them represents a milestone, uh, an activity that a user does, whether we're talking about someone booking a flight, or we're talking about someone trying to figure out how to reschedule a canceled flight, or we're talking about someone who is a crew member who's trying to sa uh, um, uh, to, to signal that um, uh, that they are in a city with a plane and could man a flight if, if the airline recognized that they were available, which their staffing system seemed to get confused and lost them. Uh, this is the user experience. So, and this is a real person's experience, right? So we have to, we have to go and meet real people. 
And so let's say we go and meet a real person. Her name is Edna and she's trying to book a flight and, you know, she, or she's trying to reschedule a canceled flight. Let's do that. So she, she gets a notification that their flight's been canceled, which she finds somewhat frustrating, but then, uh, um, uh, she's told that she can just go online to try to rebook. But then when she goes online, she showed that there are no available flights for five days. So that's really frustrating to her. And then she finally does find a, a, a really weird ass route to get to her destination. And so she starts to go there. But then it because it's going to cost more than the fare that she picked. There's some pricing discrepancy that she has to deal with. And then she finds out it's been canceled in the middle and that creates even more frustration and so on and so forth. And what we're doing is we're looking at this on a scale of extreme frustration to extreme delight. And we can map out the entire, uh, 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 process that Edna goes through trying to get home, we can map that out in terms of frustration and moments of delight. And we can look at that and we can see, okay, what was frustrating? And because we were with Edna when this was happening, we were watching Edna, we were seeing this, we could talk to her about what made it frustrating, what that experience was completely like. And that's absolutely key. We have, to, we have to really understand that experience. We're not going to get that experience by looking at analytics. We're not going to get that experience through uh, net promoter score surveys. We have to do this by actually talking to people, by actually understanding what that experience is like. And so, uh, 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 so that's the 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 key here is is understanding that experience now edna is not the only person flying there were 2.4 million people flying during the crisis but we could we could talk to a handful of them and we could find out that that kayla uh also had problems and sure enough kayla's problems were similar to edna's that she had problems here and Okay, uh, uh, we could also look at Zach's issues and Zach had issues here. And so we could start to see that there are patterns that Edna is not the only one. So if we fix Edna's problem, we're also feeling, fixing Kayla's problem. We're also fixing Zach's problem. So we're starting to fix a lot of people's problems. And the, uh, that allows us to ask this question. What if we made it delightful all the way across for Edna. Well, first we'd make it delightful for Kayla too. We'd make it delightful for Zach too. So that's beneficial to us. But this question, what does it look like if it's delightful? This is an aspirational experience. And we can turn that aspirational experience into our UX outcome. If we do a great job fixing this problem, how will we improve someone's life? Well, this is how we will improve someone's life. We will take these frustrating bits and we will raise them up until they are, they are fixed. And this becomes our UX outcome. So the way that we get to our UX outcome is we start by understanding the current experience. And the current experience, uh, uh, as I mentioned, is this timeline. And we can see whether where it's frustrating, where it's delightful. And we can ask the question, what would happen if it was delightful all the way across? That's the current experience. And that delightful, that becomes our UX outcome, right? If we do a great job, how will we improve Edna's life? And so we now have this improvement as our UX outcome. So this is our UX strategy journey. We're trying to get from the current experience, which is not delightful all the way across, to an experience that is delightful all the way across. And that's where we're trying to go. Now, most teams immediately jump to solutions, right? They start focusing on what the solutions are going to be. That's tactical. 
right? Okay, let's build something. Let's deliver something. That's an output. But what we want to do is measure that output against the improvement. Does it actually improve what's going on? Smart UX leaders don't jump to solutions first. Smart UX leaders start to ask the question, what's preventing Edna from getting those improvements today without us doing a damn thing? What what could happen without Edna, uh, uh, without us doing anything, without us providing any new solutions? What is preventing Edna from getting that? And what we end up doing is we end up making a list, a list of things that we can label the problems that we have to solve. We solve these problems and Edna gets an improvement in her life. So the problems come from the current experience. The problems inform the solution. The solution gets us the outcome. Now, that's an ideal path. In reality, not all solutions will get us an outcome. We're going to have to iterate. Iteration is a part of design. So how do we iterate? Well, we try an outcome, we try a solution, it doesn't get us the outcome. And in the process, if we're smart, we now know more about the problems. We're always learning more about the problems to solve. There's an old saying that great designers don't fall in love with their solutions. Great designers fall in love with the problems. We have to fall in love with the problems. So much so, that our UX strategy needs to spend most of its time. And by most of its time, I'm talking about a substantial amount. Most UX efforts that I see today, reactive tactical UX efforts spend about uh, uh, 80, 80 to 90% of their time on solutions, right? You know, you think of the, if, you, if you're familiar with the double diamond where you, you, you focus on the problem first and then you focus on the solution, almost all UX work is in the back diamond. It's not in the front diamond. Right? So we spend 80 to 90% of our time there. But what if we only spent 15% of our time here? What if we spent 85% understanding the problem? And so the UX strategy is to actually make our organization the world's foremost experts in the problems, the current experience and the problems to solve. If we spent all of our time there, or most of our time there, the solutions come easy. I've never met a team that if they had a solid understanding of the problem, they couldn't come up with solutions that get some sort of forward movement on their outcome right away. And so that becomes the scenario. We call this the UX strategy schematic. It's not a process. It's just the flow of how things go. We we, we look at the current experience, we understand the problems that are preventing the outcomes from that, and then we work on solutions and we see if we get the outcomes. That's the, that's the process. And if we do a good job on this, it becomes incredibly inspirational to the teams that we work with. One of the advantages of this model is it's completely measurable. We can produce measurements, measurements that can go into our OKRs, measurements, you know, those are objectives and key results, measurements that can go become our KPIs, our key performance indicators. But more importantly, measurements that actually get people excited about uh, the work we're trying to do, people excited about the outcome, because we can measure the exact moment that the outcome occurs. We can measure the progress that we're making 
to the outcome. We can measure the obstacles that the problems are coming from and how much uh, money the organization is spending. Because remember, I told you, every product and service has a user experience, but not every product or service has a good user experience. And what ends up happening is the products and services that have poor user experiences cost the organization money. And we can calculate those that money and we can actually use that as a metric to measure how much the organization is spending on bad UX versus how much the organization could be spending on good UX, which gives us a real change in the experiences of, uh, of how the organization looks at its investment in its users. So uh, who should we talk to first? Okay, so our first question comes from someone named Kip. And just a little bit of background, they said, this is regarding UX outcomes. Businesses ask and priorities are sometimes taking tasks off business workers and moving those tasks to customers with the goal of easing the work for the workers on the front line. But while moving these tasks, the customers may be in, indeed eased, but business workers' roles and responsibilities are also impacted. They impact customers and ask them to Take, the, take on too many tasks and users can get overwhelmed. So this is a question about balance in US, UX outcomes. Well, that's interesting. Uh, uh, Kev, uh, uh, can you say a little bit more about this? You should be able to unmute, I hope. Can you hear yeah. me now? Yes, I can hear right. you now. Yeah, I'm just kind of wondering, and this is something in general, I, I'm thinking about that balance of it, I think, you know, if we just had an example like um, the supermarket, we have all these kiosks, right? That uh, the supermarket no longer bags and they're not checking the items out. It's like all these tasks have been moved to the person purchasing the, the goods to do all that themselves. But if the the outcome is like the, the business eases the work on the workers at the other register. And it's trying to do that to kind of ease their workload, make their life better, but, and at the same time, not lose out on the money. But there's yet a lot of people walking out frustrated. Why did I have to do that myself? I, I might have ability challenges on these things and it, it increases the stress load. And I think sometimes the business just looks at the conversions of like, hey, we still have the money coming in, but that's not really that accurate in like how many people are walking out aggravated. And I'm right. wondering- Which, Yeah, right. So that's why we have to measure when we're doing our measurements, we have to measure the improvement to people's life. Yeah. Right? So right. If, we, if we just measure the business outcome, yeah. how many more, you know, cash register receipts <laughs> yeah. processing in a day, we might see that that number's going up. Uh, we might see that our staffing for the uh, in-person lanes can go down. Um, but the problem is that uh, we, are, we are making a poor uh, uh, experience for customers. So what in the in the self checkout model, what <laughs> often happens is the business puts self checkout into play and they say, well, since we now have four machines for self checkout, we can get rid of four lanes right. that are active. So now the supermarket has less staff doing checkout, but because people hate self checkout, they actually make longer lines and right. checkout takes longer and there's more pressure on the cashiers Plus, they have to have somebody staffing the self-checkout because right. <laughs> there's no way you're finishing that, that transaction by yourself. There's nothing self about self-checkout. Right. And therefore, uh, you get completely stuck. And so you're not seeing an improvement in the employee's life. You're not seeing an improvement in the customer's life. And this causes people to go someplace else. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that rating of 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 that person's experience is angry. Like how is how is that that really 
listen to if the business is just looking at the numbers of like right. receipts coming out, if they're really saying anything as they walk out. Yes, just and not showing up. You're absolutely right. And this is why in our in our UX metrics, your stakeholders can't ignore intensive. We are actually going to spend time saying, well, how would you measure the experience? Not the number of receipts, not the uh, staffing hours of the cashiers, but how would you actually measure the experience of customers, of the cashiers, of the cashier management? You know, how would you measure all those experiences with a uh, uh, and report that so that that those uh, fa- measurements get reported on par with all the other business measurements? Therefore, you are now in this place where you the 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 stakeholders, the people who are making the decisions, do we do more self-checkout or do we make sure we have a good customer experience? They are hearing the feedback balanced across the actual outcome. Does that make sense, Kev? Yes, absolutely. Thanks. Fantastic. That was a good question, Sydney. Let's do another one. Okay. So I I apologize first if I mispronounce your name, but our next question comes from Manaz Hajmalis, and they ask, how can we improve people's lives while helping companies make more money? Because they are not always in the same direction. Manaz, can you say a little bit more about where you're coming from on this? Because I talked a bit about this. So has your thinking evolved since you put the question in? Hi. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Welcome. Good to see you. And I love your post-it decorations. Just going to tell you right then and there. You're a true UX person. I can tell. (laughs) Thank you so much. So I totally agree with you about like how it's important to uh, improve people's life. And this should be our priority. But it's not always in the same direction as uh, companies making more money and have more profits. So I was wondering how we can put them in the same direction without like make company like make less money and like just concentrating on improving people's lives and like user experience. So maybe there is a fix for something. <laughs> so here's here's the thing. Making money while making people's lives work is a short-term proposition. You cannot exist in the market in the long term that way unless you have some sort of protection, right? So if you have monopoly status, you can get away with this. This can explain United Airlines, right? United Airlines is actually protected by the way the U.S airline system works such that a competitor, say what used to be Virgin America, comes along that has a substantially better customer experience, they can't compete. And they can't compete because the number of routes and the number of gates are set by the federal government and there just aren't any more routes or gates, so you can't expand the market. So if more customers wanna fly on Virgin America, Uh, They couldn't, which is why Virgin America eventually had to give up and sell to Alaska Airlines and basically be dismantled. And uh, United and American Airlines and Delta were able to maintain control and they have a virtual monopoly status. And as a result, they don't have to do better by their customers. They don't have to deliver a better experience to their customers because Customers don't have a choice. They have to, many of those customers have to fly on those airlines because that's the only airlines that go the places they need to go on the schedules that the customers have. So there are markets where that's there. And unfortunately, there's not a whole lot we can do about that without getting our you know, government to say, you know what, we need to make airlines more competitive. We need to actually Now, we could do it through a passenger bill of rights. We could do it by opening up the number of gates, by making the existing monopolies divest their 
uh, their gates and routes, just like back in the 70s, the phone company had to for divest itself into seven different uh, baby bells because uh, it was anti-competitive and we wanted phone companies to compete against each other. So that's why uh, you can buy from AT&T or T-Mobile or Verizon because there's competition. So we have to allow for free competition. In Europe, in Asia, airlines have much more competitive capabilities. And as a result, the quality of the flying is very good. You can go very low cost with something like Ryanair, or you can go, you know, Singapore Air or Lufthansa and pay a lot of money, but have a really good flight experience. And so there's, you can have um, a, uh, uh, you can have competitiveness. As long as you have competitiveness, making the experience worse just to make more money puts you out of business pretty quick because someone will come along and pay and, and, and have a better experience. And if you want an example of this that's pretty straightforward, just look at Apple and the iPhone. When the iPhone first came out, cell phones were a pretty miserable experience. And Apple came out with a phone with less features and cost way more money. And people would line up at four in the morning to get their phone. Nobody lined up at four in the morning to get, any, to get a Nokia phone or a Motorola phone or a Samsung phone. They would only line up to get Apple phones. And they would do that because the Apple experience was so much better. Now, not everybody bought iPhones. Most people don't have iPhones. But people will pay a lot more money for that experience. And now every other phone is compared to the iPhone. It is the market leader. So you cannot be a market leader unless you're in a protected market by focusing on making the product worse in order to make more profit. Does that make sense, Manas? Yeah, it really makes sense. And but it's so uh, it's really like uh, make it hard to compete with the leading companies when you are actually presenting a better experience, but you are not that name behind you to support you. And Maybe, but there are lots of examples of businesses that have done that. I mean, I talked about Netflix earlier. It replaced Blockbuster, and you know the iPhone put Nokia and Motorola basically out of business. And, uh, you know, I can go on and on in all sorts of different markets where someone's come along with a better experience and put the existing players out of the market. So it's, it's very doable. I mean, look at Airbnb, which basically reinvented the hotel business. Or, you know, for all of its flaws, Uber, that has a better experience than taxis. And so the, um, this, uh, this happens all the time. And it's happening more and more, and investors are investing in it. So there's, there's no faster way to get a venture, quality, venture capital investor to invest in your competition than to leave an opportunity for a better experience on the table and only go for the poorer experience because it's cheaper. Because you will have competitors like that. Unless there's protection from the government or some other force, you will have competitors because it's lucrative. And we've proved that now time and time again. Thanks for the question, Manaz. Thank you. Okay. We're on a roll, Sydney. Who should we talk to next? So our next question comes from Gerard Braston, and he asks, do you have any opinions on concept testing or tips for validating ideas or solutions before designing? Say you've conducted research and identified a problem statement and have ideas for solutions A, B, and C. How do you decide which to move forward with wireframing? Well, that's a good question. Gerard, can you say more about this? 
Yeah, totally. Um, so this is something that I've kind of been learning more about is um, sometimes like once you've kind of identified a problem statement after you've conducted research, you'll have kind of a lot of different ideas and like different directions that you kind of want to go into. Um, and sometimes it can be challenging to even just pick one to start wireframing and testing. Um, I've heard in the past about kind of like concept testing, which seems to be borrowed more from like market research. And it seems like it's a little bit contentious whether it's considered to be like a valid UX research method. And um, yeah, I was kind of wondering if you had any opinions on trying to identify what the best design direction is to go into even before you start wireframing. Right. Okay. There's a lot packed into that question. So let's take it apart. Uh, first, uh, I just want to start with the idea that there's a notion of a valid UX research method as if there's some sort of official endorsing authority on what is or is not a valid method. So, you know, if, if the method gets you insight into how to do something, it's a valid method. There's no, there's no doubt about that. That said, there are methods that steer people wrong and we want to avoid them. But uh, 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 validity of a method is not a thing. So, so we can sort of put that to bed right there. Concept testing, the funny thing about concept testing is if you ask 10 people who do concept testing what concept testing is, you'll get at least 10 answers, probably closer to 15. And I think they'll actually test out a couple versions for you. And the thing is, is that the reason that this is poorly defined is that it doesn't really mean anything. All testing is concept testing, right? I mean, if we take a finished screen and we put it in front of a user and we ask them to use it, we're testing the concept of the screen. And so there is no difference. But let's talk about this idea of what, how do you, how do you figure out what the problem is? And one of the things you said is you sort of start with a problem statement. And, th and that's where I think we start by getting ourselves into trouble. And we want to sort of fix that from the beginning. The problem here is that there is in this model, there is no notion of a problem statement. There's a bunch of problems we have to solve. And it's a long list. And, but there is no statement of the problem. The statement of the problem is Edna currently has a, a very frustrating experience, we would like to get Edna a better experience. That's the only problem statement. And so what we wanna do is figure out what does it take to get Edna's experience to be better? And we can prototype things and it doesn't matter what we start with because either it gets the experience better or it doesn't. Um, and Chances are, if we know enough about Edna's experience, oh, and by the way, remember, it's not just Edna, but we were also talking about Kayla and we were talking about Zach's experience, right? So if we make Edna's experience better, but we don't make Kayla's experience better, we we sort of failed in our overall goal. I mean, we've, we've achieved what we set out, which was to give a better experience to Edna, but we still have a list of problems that are not helping Kayla get the better experience. So, so we need to keep iterating until we, we get something that actually gets to all of the people whose experiences we're trying to make better. And the trick isn't to figure out which one to start with. The trick is how do we get a, a solution built quickly enough or get some sort of information that tells us that the solution will work or not? And so oftentimes, we can just tell by looking at the ideas what would solve the problem. Take the Netflix um, issue of increasing retention. Netflix was, was working hard to increase retention, but it wasn't retention that was actually the issue. The issue was having a customer, a segment of your customer base who have constrained budgets and a monthly subscription puts too much burden on that budget. So the problem statement of increasing subscriptions or renewals is not the right problem description. The problem description is how do we make 
that person's life better. And in talking to them, we could immediately see that there was only one show they wanted to watch. They wanted to watch Stranger Things. And when they were done watching Stranger Things, which they could finish in an entire month, they would cancel their subscription because there wasn't anything else they wanted to watch. So if we talk to them, we can find out why they like Stranger Things. We can find out why they don't like the other things that Netflix has right now. And then we can build more things like Stranger Things and less things that, that, that don't make them happy. And then maybe the problem is, is that that stuff does exist on Netflix. There is content they would watch, but Netflix's information architecture is so unwieldy that they didn't know it existed. So, okay, if, I, if we know people like Stranger Things, could we make recommendations of things they might also like that they could binge? In fact, could we do it while they're in their first month subscription? Say, you're watching their Stranger Things, and I notice you're watching it really fast. You're going to finish it, I don't know, Saturday, and you'll have 20 more days of your subscription. Here are some ideas for you to explore. So now... We are building a solution to make that person's life better by trying, by really understanding the problem. And that's the difference here. What we are really talking about is we are becoming experts. We should become the world's foremost experts on what, it, you know, Netflix should become the world's foremost experts on why people want to watch streaming television. They should understand every subtlety and nuance between all the different people who come to watch streaming television and why someone on a constrained budget watches television different than someone who has a lot of disposable income. And by becoming the experts in that, by doing more and more and more research, and this is experiential research, this is just going out and learning what it's like to be someone who watches that type of content. By studying that and really understanding it, suddenly it becomes really easy. And this idea of concept testing, which is basically just shooting in the dark and seeing if you hit the dartboard, right, goes away. Because you have such a rich understanding of the environment that the solutions become really obvious. Does that make sense, Gerard? Yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. It's a very different way of thinking about research. We have done ourselves harm by thinking that research is transactional and tactical, that we take a thing and we test it, we validate it. Either it's a good idea or it's a poor idea. And, you know, I blame Eric Reese. Right? I blame the whole lean startup thing, which is this whole mentality of come up with a hypothesis and test the hypothesis. If I produced X, would somebody buy X? Right? Nowhere in there does it start with, I'm just going to spend time really understanding the pains that people have in the world without trying to come up with a way to solve it in, in the first 20 seconds, right? I just really want to understand what that's like. You look at every successful startup and what you will find is the founders of that startup really felt the pain before they even thought of doing a startup. They we're living in the pain of not having that startup. They're like, you know, what I really want is this. And then they built a product that solved that problem for themselves. And then they realized that they are not like their users and they made sure it solved the problem for a lot of other people too, right? The people who started Airbnb, Brian Chesky and, and, and that whole group, they started Airbnb, because they wanted to have a database of people's houses they could go sleep on their couch. It was a couch surfing app to start with. And then they realized that not everybody wants to sleep on other people's couches. And they started to build it out to meet other people's needs because they realized that people did want to stay in other places, but not stay in hotels. And so they started Airbnb, and that's why it was as successful as it was. 
And then they realize that their people have these rooms and that they can use it as an income source. And, and, you know, they just grew it from there. Every successful startup, every single one of them comes from the founders themselves feeling some real pain. The ones that aren't successful are people who are like, I'm going to create a startup, but I don't know what it's going to do. We're just going to fish around until we solve a problem. Those are never successful. Okay. Thank you for that, Gerard. Let's, let's take one more question here. All right. So our last question of the day is going to come from Boris Boxson. And they ask, should we ever hope that business or leadership understands and wants to, to achieve the UX outcomes? Or do we always need to translate UX outcomes to business outcomes? Um, uh, Boris, can you say a little bit more about that? That's a great question. Sure. So uh, I'm, I'm kind of, um, I think the, to a lot of the people on this call, um, on this Zoom call, uh, kind of the, the UX outcomes really resonated and we understood it and kind of understood why it made sense. Um, and we would hope that uh, the leadership or business people who are not UX kind of centric folks uh, would also understand that mindset. But it, I, I, I hear a lot of people who say you always need to translate it into the, the initial outcomes that you were talking about. And, and I kind of, I, I struggle with that a little bit. And sometimes I can't say with, uh, you know, very strong confidence that making life better for people is going to increase specific metrics, uh, you know, with a very high degree of certainty. So, uh, but at the same time, I feel like, feel pressure to use that language in order to get the UX outcomes that I would like to achieve. I hope that made sense. Sure, sure. So the, yes, it makes perfect sense. So let's, 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 let's talk it through here. So remember, a UX outcome asks the question, if we do a great job, how will we improve someone's life? So there's, we can start with an underlying assumption that if we improve someone's life enough, people will pay more for it, right? There are people out there right now who will pay more in order to get an improvement in their life. This is how luxury items work, right? The reason someone spends the money on a Mercedes Benz versus uh, a Hyundai is that that Mercedes Benz provides something that's worth six or seven times the price of the Hyundai. So, so there's something about it. It could be the performance of it. It could be the feel of it. It could be the status that they get when they drive it around. There's something about it that provides uh, luxury. And businesses very much prefer to be a luxury business. I mean, there, you know, there's the Ryanairs of the world that, that make all their money by just selling being a discount, but they don't. That's the thing, right? There's two ways in business that you can succeed. You can either succeed by competing on cost or you can succeed by competing on quality. Now, the thing about cost is it's, it's not price, by the way, it's cost. And that's an important distinction. Price is what you charge your customer. Cost is what you pay to actually deliver the service or the product, right? So uh, the trick is, is that there's a cost and there's a price. And you always want to, to have that difference between the cost and the price because that's your profit, that's your margin, right? Competing on cost means you take your costs and you lower it. And the goal is to lower your cost lower than your competitor's cost. And the lower you can get your, your cost, you, if you get your cost, lower than your competitor's cost. So let's say your cost is here and your competitor's cost is here, right? You can set 
this is yours, this is your competitor. You can set your price to be lower than their cost, which means if they wanna match your price, they actually have to sell it at a loss. And they can't do that in the long term. They'll eat through all their savings and boom, they'll be done, right? So you have to compete by getting your costs lower than everybody else's costs. This is the Walmart strategy. And Walmart uh, uh, beats all their competitors by dealing in such volume and optimizing all their systems that their costs are always cheaper than anybody else who sells those costs. When they sell Doritos, they sell Doritos cheaper than everybody else who sells Doritos. And they do that through a variety of methods, right? The problem with this, there's two problems. One is only one person can be the cheapest cost, right? Only one business can be cheapest. Everybody else is more expensive by default. You might be able to match it, but as soon as they figure out how to do it a little cheaper, they go lower. The second thing is there's a floor. You hit zero and you cannot have your costs go below zero unless somehow you're in the oil industry where at some point during 2020, oil was going for minus $38 a barrel. Don't know how that worked, but that's what the price was. They were paying people to buy barrels. So the uh, um, uh, that was, uh, uh, that's the problem. So the alternative is quality. In quality, you have some sort of attribute. And that attribute makes you uh, more valuable to the customer than your competitor's product that's missing that attribute. This is why the iPhone sells for more money than the equivalent Samsung phone. This is why the Mercedes-Benz sells for more money than the equivalent Hyundai. And that attribute is part of the experience. So the way we talk to, to business people is A, we look at the costs of poor UX because the costs of poor UX are actually keeping us higher than our competitors. If we reduce the cost of poor UX, we can actually sell the product for less if we wanted to. But if it's really a better experience, we actually can sell it for more. And if our costs are going down and our prices are going up, we make bigger margin. And that's how you talk to business people about it. Does that make sense, Boris? It, it does. It, it really, I, I, I think you're saying that we should talk to them in business outcome language. I, I'm, I mean, this is use UX 101. Uh, you talk to your customer in the language they talk. You don't put things in your language. You put things in their language. I think that's okay. I, I'm, I really appreciate your uh, PowerPoint uh, template, by the way. It's terrific. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, uh, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, my, my, I call it whiteboard. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks for the stuff. Okay. Well, I want to thank GBC ACM. I want to thank, uh, GB SIGCHI and the IEEE, uh, computer science group for putting this on. I want to thank all of you for spending time here today. Uh, please, I, would love it if you could uh, join us at uh, Leaders of Awesomeness uh, and also check out the UX metrics your stakeholders can't ignore intensive. These things, uh, uh, we have a tremendous amount of fun. They're really educational. And more importantly, they will make your user experience work substantially more strategic, substantially better. And uh, thank you again for uh, encouraging my behavior. Uh, if you've had half as much fun tonight as I've had, then I will tell you that I've actually had twice as much fun as you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, go make some awesomeness. Take care. <laughs>